For the message this morning, please turn with me to 2 Chronicles chapter 7. Today, I want to talk about our faith. I want to talk about our relationship with God and how to have a living, active faith. The gospel tells us that we show love for God. The way we show love for God is by obeying his commands. And I think you'll agree that the New Testament is full of commands associated with living a spirit-filled life of faith, evangelizing, and trying to be letters of love from Christ to those that are in our lives, to those that are around us. It commands us to be defenders of the faith and to put on the full armor of God and the sword of the Spirit. Ephesians chapter 4 urges us to live a life worthy of the calling that we have received. What I propose to you is that we can only accomplish these things if we have a living, active faith. Not a faith that shows up for a couple of hours on Sunday morning, but a faith that is outwardly evident, that's consistent, a faith that's robust, and a faith that compels us, a faith that compels our thoughts, our words, and our deeds. Now, if any of that is new information to you, let's please talk after the service. I think a journey through Romans, Ephesians, and James, just as a start, will reinforce the need for us to have an act of faith, and and that scripture can demonstrate that to you. So if we accept that our faith is supposed to be alive, how do we do that? It just so happens we have an instruction guide. It just so happens there's a recipe for it. In fact, the Bible's pretty clear with its information on what a living faith means. And that's what I want to talk to you about in today's message. First, just a little bit of background. So, a month or so ago, during the Sunday evening message, um, I talked about the what, the why, and the how of prayer. And one of the passages that we talked about really stuck with me. And it was the first thing I thought about when Butch asked if I could be available for the message this morning. The passage I'm talking about is 2 Chronicles chapter 7, 13 to 14. I'll read that for you now. When I shut up the heavens so that there is no rain, or command the locusts to devour the land, or send a plague among my people, if my people, who are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven. I will forgive their sin and will heal their land. You know, some of us read the Bible as poetry, and that's where they find the beauty of God's word. Some of us read it as history or chronology or literature and see the timelessness of its content and the consistency of its theme of God's faithfulness. Well, I have the unfortunate task of being an engineer. Beauties for wimps. Let's talk about structure and design. That's how I see it. I see it more of a textbook or a blueprint. And I know that sounds terribly boring, but it's actually quite the opposite. Because when you see the structure in God's Word, when you see the consistent design, and you see the conscious intent with which it was written, the conscious intent, that's where I find the wonder and the miracle of God's Word. And today's scripture is no exception. So I'm always drawn to that structure. I'm always fascinated And I'm thankful when I see it. Also, when I see the timeless applications of Scripture in our modern world, in our modern lives, it's almost like God knew what he was doing. It's almost like he knew something about us humans that he created. It's almost like he purposely inspired the men to write it in just such a fashion. And it's almost like he knew that throughout time, we could rely on his word. 
It's almost like he knew we would have most of the same problems today that the human race has always had. The same problems throughout the ages. And it's almost like he knew that we would need a spiritual anchor through which to weather all of these storms. Part of what I find remarkable about the verse we read, 2 Chronicles chapter 7, it's the powerful simplicity of how it's built. The powerful simplicity of its content. And that's why I want us to take a journey and explore that a little bit further. So at the simplest level, you can break it down this way. If God's people will do three things, then God will do three things. So there's symmetry, there's balance. So what are those things? Well, if God's people will be humble, if they'll pray and seek him, and if they'll turn to him, then God says he will hear us, he will forgive us, and he will heal us. I don't know about you, but I want those things in my life. I, for one, want to make sure that God hears me, that he forgives me, that he heals and blesses me. I want God, the creator of all things, the giver of eternal life, to do those things for me. And in this scripture, it's important to note healing it has the obvious medical connotation. But there's a literal connotation also of stitching together and bringing things together to be whole. That's what he means by healing. I don't just want that for me. I want that for America. I want it for our community. Don't you think we should turn more towards God? Don't you think we need some healing? Don't you think we need some forgiving? But you might challenge me and say, look, this verse, it's a really specific context. It's talking about the dedication of the temple, and it's a nighttime response. It's a private response to Solomon from public prayer. And, you know, you're, just, you're taking it too far. You might challenge and say, look, that was kind of under the old covenant, and we're under a new covenant. And in those aspects, I would agree with you. I would also encourage you to see a broader picture. Consider 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 14 to 17. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have become convinced of because you know those from whom you learned it and how from infancy you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through Christ Jesus. All Scripture... All Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Well, I propose to you that Second Chronicles chapter 7 is part of all Scripture, and I propose that it is instructive for us. My point to you this morning is that having a living faith is what makes us God's servants and it is what equips us for every good work. We know that we serve an eternal God. We know that God is unchanging, a faithful God. And what I put to you is that this prayer for response to Solomon, Second Chronicles, the command, the promise, in addition to answering Solomon's prayer, it's directly applicable to us today. So we're going to dissect that in just a minute. And let, me, let me level set with a little bit of context. So this passage that, that we read, it's part of God's response to, to Solomon's prayer. And that prayer was to dedicate the new temple. You can read all about that in 2 Chronicles chapter 6 and 7. It's, if you're not familiar with it, it's a, great, it's a great piece of scripture. So the events and the dialogue, the prayers, everything in those two chapters when you read it, think of it also as a microcosm for Christian living. It's prophecy. It's a commentary on the failings and the weakness of man, the wonder and the faithfulness of God. It's a commentary on why we need Christ. And it's a guidebook for Christian faithful living. So the dedication ceremony and the prayer, you see that in chapter 6. 
And, you know, if you don't just happen to have that memorized, let me summarize it for you this way. It was a big deal. The whole nation was there. They've been working for decades for this moment. It was a huge part of their history, a huge part of their culture. It was going to be the center of their religion, which should have been the center of their lives, of their entire culture. Speeches, prayers, and lots and lots of sacrifices. This went on for seven days. This wasn't like a Super Bowl halftime performance, you know, 10 minutes and you're done. This was seven full days of worship, prayer, repentance, and fellowship, and sacrifice. In verses 12 through 17 of chapter 6, we see Solomon praising God's faithfulness in his covenant. We see Solomon asking God to continue to fulfill that covenant with specific respect to David's royal lineage as, as rulers of Israel. Remember, if they were faithful to God's covenant, God committed that they would always be king over Israel. But following those verses, Solomon says something really interesting in verses 18 and 19. But will God really dwell on earth with humans? He's dedicating this brand new temple. And this is part of his prayer. But will God really dwell on earth with humans? The heavens, even the highest heavens, cannot contain you. How much less this temple I have built. Yet, Lord my God, give attention to your servant's prayer and his plea for mercy. Hear the cry and the prayer that your servant is praying in your presence. Following this passage, remember, we're just kind of setting the scene here for the the scripture we're going to dissect. But following this passage, Solomon basically prophesies or reminds the people of all the different ways they have failed and could fail in the future, all the weaknesses, all the times they can turn to God for repentance and strength and guidance, all the times where they will need to call on God for help. He reminds the people of the covenant and God's faithfulness as long as they repent and seek him. The main passage we're discussing this morning, this is God's response to that prayer. So after seven days of this very public spectacle, seven days of dedication in this prayer, it's at nighttime, just God and Solomon, where God responds to that prayer. Let me read it for you again. When I shut up the heavens so there is no rain, or command locusts to devour the land, or send a plague among my people. Now, these were events, some of the specific events, through which Solomon had prayed for God's help. So God's responding. He's saying, yeah, when all this stuff happens, or if it happens, right? So God's setting the stage. God says, if my people, who were called by my name, will humble themselves and pray, and seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, I will forgive their sin, and heal their land. The rest of chapter 7 is God reminding Solomon of his promise to David, Solomon's obligation, and his lineage's obligation to stay faithful. And also a reminder of what God's people are required to do to keep the covenant. So the scenario on the surface is the dedication of the temple. You might be tempted to read that only as history. It might be easy to gloss over that, right? We don't have a temple today. One of the brothers this morning commented on that. The temple is our body. We don't have a building as a temple that's the center of our faith and religion. It might be easy to dismiss that. But if you dig a little deeper, what you'll see is a refreshing of the covenant that God has with his people. You'll see a warning and a reminder of what happens if that covenant is broken and the benefits when God's people live faithfully. In verse 14, you know, God's responding to Solomon's request for forgiveness. He tells Solomon, yes, I will forgive. Yes, I will heal. But you all have to humble yourselves. You have to pray. You have to seek and you have to repent. He qualifies that the people who are his are my people who are called by my name. So it reminds us of the requirements for 
forgiveness and blessings under the old covenant. But what I would propose to you is that when we have the kind of Christ-enabled relationship that we enjoy today through obedience to the gospel, when we have that kind of relationship with the Lord Almighty, He does hear us. When we ask, He does forgive us. When we ask, He can heal and bless us. And that's how we know we have a living faith. Basically, we're producing fruit. Consider John chapter 15, verse 16. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit, fruit that will last, and so that whatever you ask in my name, the Father will give you. So what we read in Second Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14, it's a recipe for having a living faith. So let me, let me break that down for you over the next few minutes. Let's, let's test and see if this really is a recipe for living faith. So what are the components? Well, first, we have to be named his people. We have to call on him by name. We have to have humility. We have to pray. We have to seek God. We have to be devoted. And we have to turn away from sin. So that first element, being named his people. Let's make sure we're crystal clear on what that is. If my people who are called by my name, the scripture says. So under the covenant of the Old Testament, God's chosen people were the Hebrews. They were descendants of Abraham. After redeeming them from Israel, the Lord tells the Hebrews that the Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for his treasured possession out of all the peoples who are on the face of the earth. And note here that the Hebrew version of that word called, who are called by my name, means to cry out and proclaim. So it's a very active, active sense. In this passage, God was talking to Solomon about the nation of Israel. So that was pretty easy to identify who his people are. And there's an interesting tangent here, I won't go into it, but they weren't the only people that were God's people. Think about Rahab of Jericho and Joshua. Chapter 2. Think about Ruth. Think about Uriah the Hittite in 2 Samuel and Naaman in 2 Kings. They were people who were brought into the family of God. They were people who called God, who were called by his name. But what about today? What about right now? What about you? What about me? Don't we consider ourselves... God's people? Okay, maybe, maybe my mic dropped. Don't we consider ourselves God's people? Okay, that's very low energy. Thank you for that. <laughs> I get it. Sunday mornings are tough. We are God's people. God's people started with that group of believers, that body of Christ in Acts 2 on the day of Pentecost through the work of the Holy Spirit and will continue to grow until Jesus comes back. Consider Ephesians chapter 1, verses 22 and 23. God has put all things under the authority of Christ and has made him head over all things for the benefit of the church. And the church is his body. It is made full and complete by Christ who fills all things everywhere with himself. Consider also 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 4 and 5. As you come to him, a living stone rejected by men, but in the sight of God chosen and precious, you yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. We become God's people, called by his name, simply by exercising faith in Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior and obeying the gospel through belief, confession, repentance, and baptism. That's it. That's how we cry out. That's how we proclaim ourselves as belonging to God. That's how we claim his name. The next element, humility. I'm sure that's as easy for you as it is for me, which it's not. 
I'm sure that's your favorite, just like it's mine, and it's not. How does humility relate to having a living faith? Why is this part of that recipe? Consider James 4, verse 10. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and He will lift you up. We have to remember that we don't deserve the grace that God has given us. We haven't earned it. We can't earn it. It's only by the grace of God and His love for us, which quite frankly to me is inexplicable. I think we're pretty hard to love, and somehow God has an infinite capacity to love us. Consider Philippians 2, verses 3 and 4. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves. Not looking to your own interests, but to each of you to the interest of others. Why is humility difficult for some of us? If you don't think it's hard, if you don't have a problem with humility, I kind of hope you see the irony there. I would argue that if you have any selfishness in you, and let me confess, I'm selfish. If you have any selfishness in you, you may have a humility problem. Maybe not all the time. Maybe sometimes. I don't know. That's between, that's between you and the Spirit. But the verse we read in Philippians addresses this very thing. In fact, Philippians chapter 2 is a great study on humility. We don't have time to go into all of it this morning, but let me just encourage you. Today, it's not, it's not a long chapter. Read through it and test yourself. Have a long talk with God about humility in your life. If you need any guidance on the role of that in Christian life, that's where I would, I would point you. You know, if our sole focus is on the needs of others then selfishness, it's taken completely out of the picture. Pride goes away with it. And don't forget, who's the ultimate role model of humility? Jesus Christ. I could argue that his willingness to humble himself, to go from heaven down to earth, to be constrained in a mortal body, and to suffer a completely unjust death, a completely unjust punishment, humiliation, torture. He's the role model of our humility. I could argue that's the foundational aspect of what makes Christianity different from any other religion. God humbled himself in the form of a son and came to us because history proved, our nature proved we couldn't get to him. He had to come to us. I'm not going to dwell on that anymore except for this one, one last point. The Bible talks a lot about being humble. Do a quick search on the word humble or humility. Over 300 verses pop up. 300 verses all throughout the Bible in some form or another. So it's something I propose to you we have to dwell on frequently. Hopefully daily as part of our daily recommitment to having a living faith. A great way to do that is to spend time serving others. Let others be above ourselves. If your whole life is wrapped up in just you, I think you need to have a hard conversation about priorities. You know, you can't evangelize to a mirror. It won't work. The next element, prayer. God tells Solomon, hey look, part of this deal is, y'all got to pray. Too many verses in the New Testament to mention. Too many verses in the Bible to talk about the purpose and the power of prayer. I think you'll agree with me that we are consistently admonished to pray. I think you'll agree that there are lots of examples. You know, Jesus told his disciples to watch and pray. The, the epistles contain numerous examples. I would argue, in fact, that prayer, it's at the center of this recipe both literally and spiritually. So people called by my name. Humility, prayer right in the middle. Devotion and seeking God and then turning away from sin. I could argue that's actually the pivot point of the entire, the entire recipe here. 
It's the hub around which those other aspects revolve. Prayer can lead us to salvation through the gospel of Christ. To be his people, that's the first element. Proper, frequent prayer, and I would emphasize frequent more than proper, just pray, however, frequently, all the time. That helps us be humble. Because if you're praying to God Almighty, it automatically helps your heart and your attitude get into a better, better position just by acknowledging the wonder and the majesty, the power, the infinite love of God. Remembering that all good things in our life, all of our blessings come from God, not from our own doing. Intercessory prayer. It's an act of service. It reminds us that others probably have needs greater than our own. Prayer is one of the ways that we seek the Lord. That's going to be the next element we talk about in a minute. It's one of the ways we show our devotion. And it's the vehicle of repentance. God, forgive my sin. God, forgive me for this. God, strengthen me to resist this temptation. We could spend a year talking more about this. I'll, I'll wrap up this aspect with just a few points. You know, God not only listens to us through prayer... He wants to hear from us. Our prayer to God is not something he's busy doing and listens to with half an ear. It's not something he just tolerates and puts up with. He's waiting for us. He wants us to pray to him. He wants us to pray to him. Look in Jeremiah chapter 29, 10 to 15. It's one of just numerous examples of where God expresses his desire. He wants to hear our prayer. And in fact, even more than that, God wants to give us the desires of a spirit-filled heart. I'll quickly read Psalm 145, verses 17 to 20. The Lord is righteous in all his ways and faithful in all he does. The Lord is near to all who call on him, to all who call on him in truth. He fulfills the desires of those who fear him. He hears their cry and he saves them. The Lord watches over all who love him, but all the wicked he will destroy. And you know, prayer can have mighty results. Prayer can be so, so powerful. Matthew 21, verses 21 to 22. Jesus replied, Truly I tell you, if you have faith and do not doubt, not only can you do what was done to the fig tree, but also you can say to this mountain, Go throw yourself into the sea, and it will be done. If you believe, you will receive whatever you ask for in prayer. I can't think of a better ally in my life than Christ my Savior and God Almighty the Creator. Prayer is how we talk to God. It has to be part of our daily, living, active faith. The next element, God God reminded Solomon... Yep, you need to be called by my name, humility, prayer, and you have to seek my face. It communicates the idea that we have to be devoted. We have to make this a priority. This is something we intentionally do. It's not something that happens. Our seeking God's face is something that we have to make happen. It's conscious. It's often, it's often done. And there's also a New Testament admonition to do the same thing in Colossians 3, 1-3. It was our scripture reading earlier. Since then, you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on earthly things, for you died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. So, you always get more of what you focus on. You always get more of what you focus on. So, setting our minds on things above creates that spiritual, eternal focus. And it makes sure we are seeking God instead of ourselves. And make no mistake, all of you are seeking something. All of us are seeking something. What is it you're seeking? Is it purpose? Is it money? Is it pleasure? Is it ego? Is it healing? Is it service? Is it recognition? Is it help? All of us are seeking something. 
what are, is it, what are you seeking? Who decides what you seek? We have to fill that void with the right priorities if we are to have a living faith. We are not called to be passive. We're called to have an active faith. We're called to live by the Spirit. Consider Romans chapter 8, Matthew 6, 33, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and others. Other scriptures, other references. It requires us to actively seek God, not as a matter of salvation, but as a response to the Spirit living in us. Seeking God needs to be a priority for us. And part of that is seeking God in all phases of our life. Seeking God in every circumstance. I can't tell you how many times before I thought, said, or did something, I wish I had said, where is God in this? Before before I respond, where is God in this? What would Jesus do? What does the scripture say about this? When I face judgment, how will I wish I had responded in this situation? Seeking God as we strive for righteousness, seeking God to know his will in our lives, seeking God's wisdom, his forgiveness, his blessings, etc. We seek God through how? Through Bible study, through prayer, through service, through evangelizing, Bible study, fellowship. So decide what kind of person you want to be, whether you're young, whether you're more advanced in years. What kind of person do you want to be starting today? Well, whatever kind of person you are is what you have been seeking. The person you want to be is what you should be seeking. If we're not seeking God, then what are we seeking? What are we not doing if we're not seeking God? Sorry, if we're seeking God, what are we not doing? What does seeking God help remove from our lives? Thinking of ourselves, rationalizing our desires, justifying our sin, being placated in our weakness, the list goes on. Actively seeking God as a prayerful living faith enables us to find his will in our lives. And isn't that our ultimate purpose? To find his will in our lives and act on it through the strength he gives us? So we've talked about the attitude of being called by his name. We've talked about the mind of being humble, the heart of being humble. We've talked about the Spirit working through us in prayer and having a devoted heart. Now we're going to shift to the last element, which is turning from wicked ways. Turn here is a verb. That's an action word. It's not passive. It's active. And in the verse, in that context, he was, of course, speaking to the people of Israel, but this also applies to us today. I'm pretty sure if you're human, you face temptation. I'm pretty sure if you face temptation, you fail. Sometimes, frequently, rarely, all the time. I think it depends on what the temptation is and where we are with our faith. But turning from our wicked ways is a conscious design to help us avoid those circumstances where we're tempted. Turning from our wicked ways means asking forgiveness and repentance when we fail. It's encouraging and admonishing others to do the same. It's reaching out for help from our Christian family when we need it. A few encouragements from the New Testament. If you remember in Acts 26, when Paul is recounting to Agrippa his encounter with Christ on the road to Damascus, Christ told Paul, I am sending you to them to open their eyes and turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God so that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. We see how the Thessalonians are praised for turning away from wickedness as part of their model for being, you know, they were called, you're a model for other believers. And in in chapter 1, verse 1, they tell how you turned to God, how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God. So turning from wicked ways comes very naturally from seeking God. All of this holds together. All of these elements work together to help us achieve that living faith. This final act of turning from sin, therefore turning towards God, is the final enabling step to have a living faith. 
To me, it's a signal that you've done the other things. You've put on Christ. You've been humble. You're prayerful. You're seeking God. And that enables you to turn from sin. Now, here's the tough part. We have to do that every day. Let me, let me be more transparent. I have to do that every day. I hope you're better than me. But if you're not, remember, you're living faith. We have to go see it. We have to go find it every day. We have to go decide today is a day I'm going to live for my God. So I hope this has been an encouragement to you to strive for a living faith. Once we believe, once we're called by his name, we should strive for that through humility, through prayer, continuously seeking God, and turning away from sin. When you read chapter 6 to 7, it's amazing to me as another example of God's consistency through time, through the entire Bible. There's no discrepancy between his character in the Old Testament and the New Testament. He remains willing and eager to hear, to forgive, to heal. And now for us, Jesus Christ, he's paid that price for our sins. There's no need for sacrifices in a temple once we go to God to faith and obey the gospel. So let us, as the body of Christ, let us as a Christian family, let us as individual servants of God Almighty, let us strive to live a life worthy of the calling we have received. Let us follow God's example, therefore, as dearly loved children, walk in the way of love, just as Christ loved us, and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. One needs to only call on his name, to be humble, prayerful, seeking his face, turning from sin, to have a living faith. Now, if you don't have Jesus in your life, let us help you. If you've been putting off that decision, maybe today's the day you commit yourself to our Lord and Savior. Maybe today's the day you make that most important decision in your life. A couple of us will be down front. If you need encouragement, if you need prayer, if you want to put on Christ and baptism, we would all be blessed by that decision. Please join me as we stand and sing.